is very thankful to have our own club member, Mike Bell, um, from Relax. <laughs> I'm going to let Mike tell his backstory. Thank you very much. Uh, I, number one, had some homework for you, and I was shocked that some people came up for the Barbara. Oh, yeah. Man, she like did the homework plus some. I did. Uh, <laughs> my name is Mike. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Mike Bell. I am a uh, high school teacher of 21 years at Glassboro High School. Um, I've been speaking um, for a couple years now. Uh, I went to Paulsboro High School. Um, I was all state football. Uh, we had a state record for winning streaks, still intact today. We won 63 games in a row. Uh, state record for state championships in wrestling, um, the, the amounts of them. Uh, I am in the Paulsboro High School Sports Hall of Fame. Uh, Ironman triathlete for the past two years. Um, I qualified for the Ironman World Championships. I was a 305 pound defensive tackle at Rutgers. Um, and Dan says I have to tell everybody that I was in the wing bowl one year. Uh, eight, uh, 68 wings, which was a record for 10 minutes. Uh, 68 wings in, in 10 minutes. Um, I did have some homework for people to do. Now, three of them, well, one of the things was for choosing your best self traits. I've been teaching for a long period of time and I do this myself. People that I mentor, uh, anywhere from adults, if I'm, to deal, if I'm working with them, younger adults, uh, we always talk about our, our, what makes us the amazing people that we are. Because a lot of the times, we're not thinking that, we're usually thinking the opposite. You're looking in the mirror thinking negative things. It's, I call that our anti-self. Um, so I did have a homework assignment. We'll make it pass fail. Uh, and I also ask people to choose one word. And I think it's important for me, number one, for me, but all the kids I work with, people that I work with, to, to have something motivating them for 365 days of the year. Um, one word can be very impactful when you, but the reason for choosing it really has to come, come from you. So I did have a homework assignment. Who did the homework in here? We have one, two, who wants to come up here? I know she wants to come up. Barbara, I'll put you uh, in front of everybody. <laughs> so, my joke is that my husband assigned me by one word because he says I'm a shopper. So, <laughs> and I had to share with my So, shopper is your one word. Yeah, it really is. And I'm just a good shopper, though. Did you choose the one word? You know what? My word would be courageous. And why would it be courageous? Because a lot of times I am very anxious about doing certain things, so I try to overcome that and think of myself as So courageous. as your word for one year, 365 yes. days, it's courageous. Yes, I would pick that. That's uh, not all my homework though here. Best self so, traits. So because I'm a good shopper, I found this in Marshalls after I started my homework. I'm like, oh, look at that. I found a shirt. <laughs> Describe, like, well, they're not all the words I would describe myself, but I do like a lot of these. Powerful, strong, grateful, kind, influential, beautiful. I say I still need a little work on that. And apparently, <laughs> and apparently your husband said you should have big spender on her. <laughs> this was on sale at Marshalls. <laughs> uh, anybody else want to take a shot at this? One more person. Two more people. Two more people. Want to take a shot? You can just stand where you're at. <laughs> Come on, man. Listen, do you imagine? Now you understand you have children, right? Now you understand how it is as a teacher when you ask a kid to, act, to speak up in class and they won't, they won't do nothing. Two more people. Roberta, I'm picking on you. Stand up. Roberta, stand up. Tell everybody what your one word is. I know you choose one. You chose one. My one word is happy. I'm basically a happy person. I'm happy with where I'm at in my life right now. And I'm happy that I have met all of you, and this has been a whole new thing for me in the past three years. And um, every day I wake up and I just think to myself, I'm just really, I'm a lucky girl. I'm happy, I'm happy with myself. I like myself. I like all of you. Roberta, three best self traits that make you the amazing person that you are. What are they? Three best self traits. I'll give you an example. Three of my best self traits, we'll just throw a couple out. Mentally, physically tough, I'm driven. I think I'm funny sometimes. <laughs> Very caring. What are three best self traits for you that make you the great person that you are? I'm competitive. <laughs> yeah. What else? She is real. Uh, what else? Two um, more. 
uh, uh, I love meeting new people. Um, uh, You're outgoing. Uh, I am outgoing, and I and I've been loving to volunteer. I love to give back. I like to give back. See, here's the thing. We always like when I work with adults, and you ask them, "What are your best self traits?" They can't really think of them. But then if I flip it around, I say, let's work on anti-self. What are they? I'm lazy. I'm, I'm, I'm fat. I'm too skinny. I'm, uh, I, I'm not courageous. I don't set goals. It's We pick ourselves apart instead of looking at the best things. And sometimes we need to sit around and write these things down. Mm -hmm. I have every kid that I work with write down 10 to 13 of them, and then we revisit that every once in a while. One word, everybody. I need one one. Male in here do this. One guy, go ahead. You want to stand up, introduce right. yourself, and then give, give us your one word, your reason, and your new. We're putting you right on the fire, and then a couple of your best self traits. Go ahead. So my one word is optimism. And why did you choose that? So to a fault, almost like in whether it's optimistic about others and what they can do. So like I, I always look for the value in other people but also in myself. Like I'm always optimistic that no matter how far or how far off track I get or whatever that they, I can always come back from that. Three of your best self traits that make you the amazing person that you are. Um, I would say uh, hard working is one uh, for sure. Um, I think that the, I'm trying to make that hard working, um, I'm relentless. Like, I will, it's, it's, it's all or nothing. I always say that, like, I'm 150% or 0%. Like, I'm all in all the time. Um, that's why I get injured all the time, too. <laughs> <laughs> but then, and then the, the, the third one I would say is, um, is missing. Um, hard working. Um, yeah, I forget. <laughs> So I'm an athlete, and it's one of the things that, like, if in order to kind of find what your purpose is and what you enjoy doing, like, being an athlete and being in sport is what kind of gets the most out of me and what I enjoy doing the most. Guys, let's give those guys a round of applause. The last time I did this, a kid had thought of money, and if you're going to get, you know, you're a spender, so you're going to get $10 for Amazon. There you go. <laughs> And I'm getting money now. And you were pulling your, you were lifting your shirt. <laughs> so I think I just kind of proved the point there that most of you guys in here have kids, grandkids, some of you future kids, is when your kids are struggling and you want them to be your best self. Even ourselves as adults, if you ask ourselves that question, some of you guys can't even answer it. You can't answer what your best self traits are, but yet we want other people to do these things. And I think that's something that we can always continually grow, no matter how old you are. Just thinking about what the great, what, why am I the great person that I am? What do I want my child to be? Uh, one word is very impactful for me. Now, one of the things that I do. This next part here is something that I do now, and it means something to me. Does it fit in a little bit here? Well, it can, but you can also take the message. One of the biggest problems that we have as a high school teacher and in the United States of America and the world is opioid uh, epidemic, illicit drugs on the rise and really not stopping, period, going up. Most of you have grandchildren, like I said on here, 50% of kids ages 12 to 17 have abused drugs at one point or another. Absolutely, and if you think about it, and I'm sitting in a classroom teaching the other day, and I'm looking around at a classroom of 30, and like 20 of the kids in there I know have absolutely done drugs, and they drug one kid out right then and there. And he has a vape pen in his hand, and he's trying to throw a vape pen at some guy, and he's going like this. These are our kids. These are our future, and they're, they're kids when you, if you're a teacher and you're in the room, you'd be like, never, I would never even thought that. But this is a problem, right? Because 61 increase of eighth graders. That shows these kids 100,000 100, 100, suicide deaths, or excuse me, overdose deaths. Overdose deaths. And I think that overdose deaths. And I think if we can keep educating people on these things, and I'm going to be honest with you, I showed up to an Ironman event one time and a guy was getting stoned. Look, look marijuana is legal, period. 
just like alcohol. But you got to be responsible doing what you're doing. I mean, I seen a guy right after a race, he was getting stoned, and he got right in his car and then just drove off and actually peeled wheels leaving the parking lot. All right, so these things have consequences, big time consequences. I just raced in the Ironman World Championships, and I was in the last wave of the race. And I told my wife, I, I mentioned her, I'll move myself back and be the last swimmer, period. And I want to pass people. So I got in the water, and I start passing people, and I got to a certain point on the bike course, and it looked like somebody had been killed in a bike accident. There were two bikes on the, on the ground, and I looked for a second and just kept going, knowing to find out that while we were getting into order to race the World Championships at 7 in the morning, there was a young lady at 7 o'clock in the morning getting drunk and stoned and decided to get behind the wheel of a car and blow past the detour people. Um, and this is like someone's daughter. I guarantee you she did not think that morning that she was going to get up and just kill two people, try to kill two people, which she almost did. Those people were seriously injured, one from the United States, the other one from, um, not from around here. So we got to think about what the consequences are. The number one problem that I see in, in schools, one of the huge ones is vaping. All right? and these kids don't realize that when they're vaping, they are causing instant damage. One vape, damage to the lung, irreversible. Damage to the lung, irreversible. We have any nurses in here? Nurses? No nurses in here? Um, stuff's scary because all the kids are doing it. We have a fire alarm each week. Kids are vaping, you know, flavored nicotine, nicotine, marijuana, and that's, that's what's going on. Um, it is a huge problem. They don't realize that all the damage you're doing, all irreversible, all right, cardiovascular disease, heart attack, stroke, cancer. And the kids are like, well, I can only get cancer in my lungs. That's not true. You can get it anywhere in your body. All right, the other problem is opioids. Now look, I'm going to show you a picture after this. You got to see it because I tell the kids when I'm going in to speak, you want to scare these kids? Or you want to paint a room and like they're gonna walk out of here and be like, yeah, I can do that stuff too. On opioids, we had a kid and, and like, well, there was a kid in a school uh, decided to take 12 uh, oxycontins and walk around in the hallways all day. 12 oxycontins walking around in the hallways, and he told his parents that he thought that he could just walk around in the halls and hide in the bathrooms all day. I mean, these these are things that are going on in schools and are starting out young. Then it's leading on to other different things, you know, heroin and fentanyl, and then. You go on the streets, one of the newer things on the streets is this thing called Trank. It is an animal tranquilizer that actually rots the body from the inside out. Um, and you're going to see some pictures here. Um, and this is what, what happens. All right. Uh, one time taking this, you can get infected with this. They dr you can drink it. You can crush it, put it in a pill, they can inject it. Wherever you inject it, that does not mean that that area is going to happen. It can happen. You can inject it into your arm and it happens to your foot. They're putting it in alcohol. They're, put, they're, they're dousing it over weed. So if somebody goes to buy weed off the street, they could end up with this. They said 90% of the drugs tested in Philadelphia have had trank in it. And that's the new thing. It's kind of like the epicenter where it started is in, in Philadelphia. So when I'm going around speaking, you got to show kids. They say, I don't want to see that. Well, then why are you doing drugs then? Because that's what's going to happen to you. And it's irreversible once you do damage like this. Alcohol. Tell the kids all the time, listen, if you're going to drink, you're going to run into problems. There's a reason why they say 21 to drink, 21 to buy marijuana, because the young kids, our bodies are not fully developed. Brain's not developed. Heart's not developed. Lungs. So these things can cause problems to people. Obviously, addiction with, with these things. All of them. Um, which leads me kind of into what I'm here talking to you about with Meg. We all have choices and, con and those choices, positive or negative, right, have consequences. We are all adults in this room. And like I said, many of you have kids. Um, you know, do you talk to your kids about these consequences or what can happen? Do you talk to kids about your family history? You know, my wife had to tell when I met Catherine, she had a four-year-old, Logan. She had to explain to Logan that her grandfather is an alcoholic and has had cancer. Dad is a heavy smoker. And you have these genes in you that you can ignite them at any one point or another, right? I don't know if many people do this. I always talk when I'm talking to adults. I'm like, do you let them know that? I was talking to a teacher the other day. She's like, my daughter's vaping in fifth grade. And I said, she goes, I smoked in sixth grade, she says. My mom smoked in sixth grade. so." Every generation of their family, they're passing these traits off 
And all they're doing, as soon as they do it, you just turn the trait on. The traits, I mean, we have cancer traits. Everybody in here has cancer cells in them right now. We're fighting them off, right? But some of you, right, some of us have it growing in our family. So, right? We have these different things. Heart disease, Crohn's disease, all these different things. Do we ever talk to our kids about these? Some of these things can be prevented, though. A lot of them. Matter of fact, cardiovascular disease is the number one killing death in the United States. Cancer is second. All right. A lot of the issues that come from cardiovascular disease, we can prevent. The number one preventable death in the United States of America is smoking. Right? Is smoking. So we can prevent that, but we got to make sure that we're educating the kids. Now, I told you guys, positive choices lead to positive things for all of us in here, even for your grandkids when you're when you're speaking to them, right? Or your children, or your future children. All right. But how how do how do we break these chains? All right, I come from a family um, where my stepfather started drinking as a teenager, alcoholic, in and out of jail, mental health issues, uh, used to be my mom. My mom started drinking as a teenager, smoking as a teenager. All right, Crohn's disease, cancer, all right, my stepdad died in his 60s. My mother passed away in her 60s because of all the things. The crazy thing was her parents did these things. My father. Didn't really have a great relationship with him. Uh, same thing. Started drinking in his teens. Started smoking in his teens. Cardiovascular problems. Heart attack, stroke, fall in Vietnam. Mental health issues. Attempted suicide many times. And then finally died right around the 60s. My brother. Younger brother. Being born into this. As we talked about things being passed down. All right. Started drinking in his teens. Started smoking. Started dealing drugs attempted suicide and was successful age 30. My mother passed away six days later. My father passed away a couple months later, all within one year. All of them had the same problems and they all came from the same thing. I call it intergenerational trauma, intergenerational addiction. And that becomes a problem, right? Because you're passing things down to people. We all have great things in here, all of us. We have different traits, athletic traits you might get from loved ones at home, right? We have great things that we get. Roberta's great looks. Barb's great looks. All right? Lou's great looks. We get passed down. We get great things passed down from our parents, but unfortunately, we get some bad things passed down. So how do we change that? You know? How do we change that? Myself. All right? I grew up in a household, all right, at six years old, where I was sexually abused, physically abused, emotionally abused, neglected, physically, emotionally. There was uh, alcohol and drug use out in the open. Domestic violence. Stepdad had mental health issues. He got locked up a, a handful of times. And at the age of six, I walked in a room one day, and my stepdad was trying to my stepdad was trying to kill my mom as a six-year-old little boy. And my first reaction was to save my mom. I went and grabbed the knife, stabbed my stepdad, and we ended up almost. He did not die, although I wanted him to die in that moment as a six-year-old little boy. I want to protect my mom. We end up homeless, living on the streets in Camden. And by the first grade, we end up moving to Paulsboro. All right, Paulsboro, we, we had moved around to like 10 or 11 different places. In Paulsboro, what I did not know at the time was that growing up as a six-year-old little boy, what we know now about trauma and these things, they have these things called adverse childhood experiences. When you grow up in a house with alcohol, drugs, someone's been to jail, there's domestic violence, there's uh, all these dead mental health issues. You end up homeless. There's 10 of them, right? And they say that the more you get, the more impact you have. If you have three of them, and it doesn't even matter which ones you have. If you have three, they say you will struggle in school. You're going to miss school. If you don't have proper intervention. As a six-year-old kid, I had all 10, which basically said you're probably going to be dead by the time you're 55 or 60 without proper intervention because you will end up doing the same things as what your parents do without proper intervention. And I never had that intervention. At first grade in Paulsboro, struggled. It was like starting as a six-year-old kid, it was like really like a, a new start to my life as a six-year-old little boy living in Paulsboro. I was so happy, but at the same time, I was scared of everything. Everything that would go on, I just had depression and anxiety. It was always fear of like what was coming next around the corner. All right, struggled in school. One of the things with all those things when you're dealing with trauma, Education, your brain's not right, right? There's different the delays with different things. And I definitely did not like school, and I struggled there. By the time I got to 12 years old, 
All right, I don't know if you have any of these people at, 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 that you've grown up in your household, but this is every, and the picture's not coming out all the way. Everybody in that picture is 12 years old. Gene, everybody's 12. Where am I at? <laughs> you can stand up if you want. Back row in the middle. You're the coach. The back row, this guy right here, the coaches are there. You're saying here? Gene is correct. Uh, I was a large kid. Large. Large kid. But see, when you guys see this picture, I usually put it up around the Little, the little League World Series when it's coming up, because you always see these big kids. Like, what the heck? No that, right? There's, There's no, no, way. no way. He's the bus driver. They just call the bus driver. <laughs> They're like, the bus driver's up. I'm like, I had to bring a birth certificate and all this stuff. But when you look at this picture, and I was a good athlete. When I played sports, and we're all athletes here, when I played sports, it felt like I was that one time when I could keep my mind away from everything that was going on with me. And it was still a struggle, but it was that, it was that freedom for me. I was very good at baseball, but at this point in my life, I was thinking about a bunch of different things. Number one, my dad had never really fully been into my life, and I started getting curious, man, just like kids get, just like your children have got. And I hatched this plan, I said, I'm gonna steal money out of my mom's pocketbook, and I'm gonna get on a Greyhound bus, and I'm going to go to Miami, Florida to find my dad. That's where I'd live. He was like a deadbeat dad to live down there. And, you know, there's never really any contact. I, at the, the times that I did meet him, they were not positive things. There was like beatings or something like that. And they were very, I did not see him a whole lot. But when I did, they were negative reactions. But someone was telling me to go down here and, and go down here. Maybe life is better in Miami. So I was 12 years old, looking like that, looking like the bus driver. I got on a bus and headed to Miami, Florida by myself. And I got down there and found my father by myself. And I was back home in Polsboro within 24 hours. Wow. Because my dad didn't want to have any kids. So a 12-year-old little boy is playing Little League, playing with G.I. Joes and all these things. Within two weeks of returning from Florida, I started drinking alcohol and smoking marijuana. And instantly, that first drink of alcohol, I knew I was hooked. I was like, that, that's what I was looking for. It was that thing that could get my mind away from all the trauma that I was dealing with, right? Smoking weed was a thing, but like the alcohol was a thing. And I knew instantly that this was something that I wanted to have in my life. Within two months, I started dealing with cocaine. So I was a little boy, and then all of a sudden, I'm hanging on the drug set, cutting up cocaine, and dealing cocaine on the streets. And it happened, it went zero to 60. And when you're dealing drugs, you know, Gene was a police officer. Any other police officers in here? You're dealing with, you're, you're around people that are doing horrible things. And that's how my life changed like that in an instant. By the end of my freshman year, I'd be locked up in jail because I started doing a lot of horrible things. Right, hanging with the wrong people, making a lot of money selling drugs. As a 12-year-old little boy in seventh grade, things just escalated, man, just like this. By the end of my freshman year, locked up in jail, man, because I was doing a bunch of bad things, breaking into people's houses, stealing things. I didn't even need the money. I had thousands of dollars. As a 13-year-old little boy, I had $10,000 sitting in my, my room and, and sheets and stuff, like literally stuffing pillows with money because that's how crazy things got. And when I got out of jail, I was in there for about three weeks, and I got out, and they sent me scared, the Scared Straight program at Broadway State Prison. Anybody ever heard of that here? Yeah. <laughs> It was absolutely crazy. I was actually excited to go, and then when I walked in, and when I walked in, it was like crazy because things changed. I was inspired, and I was motivated because they brought us in a room like this, and then they brought the people in that were in there for life. And things changed very quickly once the door shut because the adults that brought us there, all of a sudden, they like walked out, and the inmates came in, and then they locked the damn door. <laughs> and the people in there that thought that they were tough, they were no longer tough. Right? What happened in that room, they couldn't have, I know they had TV, kids ask me all the time, what episode is it? I said there wasn't an episode because they wouldn't have been able to put what happened in that room on TV. Because people had things stripped from them, like stripped down, clothes stripped from them, little kids in there that thought that they were tough, they were not, no longer tough anymore because you had people in there that were in there for life saying, I will smash your head in. And they were dead serious, snatching people up. And when I got out, 
like I said, we left, we got on the bus, I was inspired, I was motivated. By the time we got off the bus, I wasn't, I, that was it. I got off and I forgot about that because inspiration and motivation will only get you so far. You gotta have that drive, all right? So when I got out of the, the uh, scared straight thing, I started to excel at sports, in high school sports. By the end of my sophomore year, I started to get recruited by uh, many schools for football. I was a pretty good wrestler, very good baseball player, but my grades sucked. By the time I became a junior in high school, I had missed almost 300 days of school. 300 days from first grade, really going into senior year was almost 360 days, but I just didn't go to school and I, I could do really what I wanted to do. But my grades were horrible. I had a 1.0 GPA, 1.0, and I had a 5.10 on my SAT. And you guys know in here, when you took the SAT back in the day, you got 500 for putting your name on the test. <laughs> I got 10. <laughs> so it was a struggle. But I had a great, there were people just like you guys in this room. There were police officers that were very friendly to me. They knew what was going on. I mean, they were at my house often. All right? I had great coaches. I had great teachers. I mean, one of the reasons why I'm a teacher today is because of the impact that they had on my life. Um, they pushed me. And I ended up, by the end of my senior year, I had a 2.0, 700 from the SAT, 710. I got 200 extra points. And I got a full scholarship to go to Rutgers University. And I thought at that moment um, that when I signed in February of my senior year, I thought that, you know, that was going to be, you know, the next part of my life was going to go to the NFL. And shortly after signing, I was dealing with all these mental health issues, depression, anxiety. And after I signed the scholarship, I was scared. I was there, like scared but excited. And it was a suicide attempt. I got drunk, was doing drugs, and drove my car off into some stuff. And, you know, I didn't think that I was prepared or worthy of doing what I was doing from my history. Because I, I could not get rid of all the trauma that, that was in my past. It was really important to know how to deal with it because the things that I had went through, I never dealt with. So I go to Rutgers University, and within the first five months, I'm arrested again. All right, played my freshman year. I said, I don't, I'm worried about graduating. I'm going to the NFL in three years. So I really don't care. Right? It doesn't matter to me. So get arrested. Sophomore year starting, and I said, All right. Two more years in the NFL. I get injured the week before the first game. Devastating injury. I tore every single ligament in my left knee. And I was already dealing with depression and anxiety, so that stuff went through the roof. And when you're depressed and you're an alcoholic, what do you do? You drink. DWI. Arrested. At Rutgers two times within two years. Kicked off the football team. Suspended for a semester. All right, but see, I was one of those kids that I thought I knew it all. You can't tell me. I tell you. I don't have a drinking problem. But as soon as I got my license back, guess what happened again? Got another DWI. Because when you're an alcoholic and you don't fix your problems, they continually go on and on and on. Except the second time I got into an accident and almost killed somebody. That's what you're dealing with. So we go through Rutgers. I end up starting my junior year into my senior year. And I played, thought I played well looking back then. But I never really applied myself because I was an alcoholic, getting almost kicked out of Rutgers twice, right? So there was a lot of problems. I ended up graduating from Rutgers, and I started teaching. And just like at high school when I went to Rutgers, all those problems, alcoholic, getting arrested, bad grades. Without fixing them, they followed me to Rutgers, and then they followed me out into the, the real life. You know, I wouldn't take a test no more, but when you cheat on things and you do things, you, you create these really, really bad habits that have never gotten fixed. So I start teaching, and I go about uh, eight years of teaching. And when I started teaching, like the year before, I had never done cocaine before. I was like, had done other drugs, mushrooms and acid and all these different things. And, but full-blown alcoholic, I went out one night and I said, I had, I had to like premeditate, which kids do by the way. I said, I'm going to try cocaine tonight with these guys and, you know, we'll see, see what happens. Just try it once. That's it. That's all I'm going to do. And I tried it and I was hooked instantly. I had no idea that when my parents had me, they were also doing cocaine. So, alcoholic, gene, turned on. Cocaine, turned on, just like that. 
And that thing ignited me, man. It was like, woo, this is what I'm looking for. And cocaine led to ecstasy, crystal meth. And now I'm dealing with big time problems because I'm a teacher with some serious, serious issues that have never been dealt with. We get eight years in and we're in 2008, I'm up at Rutgers. The place that gave me a scholarship. I was staying at the hotel I stayed at when I committed to go to Rutgers. And we go out all high on cocaine and drugs and drinking and all these crazy things. And the next thing I know, I wake up in the hospital. And I'm like, what the hell's going on here, Lou? Like, what happened? They were like, oh, you you got up on the roof of the hotel and we're getting ready to jump, dude. They had to tackle you. I had no idea. It was very real, very surreal. It's not like I'm sitting here saying that it didn't because it did happen because I remember bits and pieces. But they were like, you were getting ready to, you were getting ready to kill yourself. And they strapped you up, took you out, and that's why I woke up. The next week, I'm in my apartment on a four-day drinking and alcohol binge with a bunch of guys that were bad people. And I'm sitting in my apartment, and I'm looking at the TV, and I'm like, this guy getting ready to do this Iron Man, man. And I was like, sat and watching the TV, and it was just this connection where I was like inspired and motivated watching this guy. Same story as me, 12-year-old kid, ran away from home, alcoholic drug addict, all these crazy different things. And I stopped what I was doing and I sat down and watched the TV. This guy, his name was Todd Crandell. I was like, just sitting there and I said it out loud, I was fat, I was out of shape. I was sweating getting out of bed in the morning. That's how out of shape I was. It was, it was funny at the time, like I thought it was funny, but I'm like, I was on my way to not being around anymore. The week before, I almost committed suicide. My body was deteriorating from like the inside, I could tell. Like things were like slowing down. Like my breathing was labored. I knew that the end was coming up soon, whether by my means or by overdoing it with the drugs. And in that moment, watching that TV, man, I said something, something, there was something that happened. And I said, I'm going to do an Ironman. And everybody looked at me and literally laughed at me. Every <laughs> single person was like, there was. You are so messed up on drugs right now. You don't know what the hell you're saying. You're washed up. You can't get up the steps without sweating. And I said, I'm doing an Ironman. And the next morning, it was crazy. The next morning, I got up and had to ask myself some questions. Because it, it was we were at this moment where, you know, I was trying to change my life. That's from uh, 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 Scared Straight. How I got behind I asked myself three questions. The first one was, what is, and I looked straight in the mirror. What is it going to take for me to become an Iron Man and turn my life around? What's it going to take? What am I willing to put myself through to achieve it? I just beat myself up and almost killed myself. What am I willing to do to achieve it? And then the last one, last one, what am I willing to give up to achieve it? And I asked everybody in here to choose one word because it's very impactful for me. And it was very simple. That one word was everything. I was willing to do everything to get my life back. And in that moment, that's what happened. But it didn't happen over, overnight. It was a whole, card, whole cold fact. It was a fact that in that moment, I was ready to have a transformation. Nobody believed me at all. And I gave them a good reason not to believe me, right? Like kids do things, and I tell kids all the time, you keep coming late to school every day. You're just a kid. You're late every day. Or you're at, this is who you are. If you want to change it, you got to change your behavior. You got to change your mindset of what you want to do. All right, so a couple of those things, all right? I had to figure out what my best version was. And up to that moment, even from a little child, I never knew what, I never knew what was good inside of me because I never knew anything that was really positive. At six years old, that's the, as far as back as I really can remember, it was not a lot of good things, not a lot. I did not know what good traits I had. And I knew all the bad ones, so I said, why don't I do this? I'm a quitter. I quit every sport I played in high school, and I'm in the Hall of Fame. I can't figure out, I was almost embarrassed getting the award. I said, I have to change that. I'm not goal oriented. I need to change that. I'm drinking, I need to change that. I'm doing drugs, I need to change that. People don't trust me, I have to change that. I gotta learn how to trust other people, trust myself. I need to be mindful of who I am, right? I'm an alcohol and drug addict. If you're going to put yourself in bad situations, you're going to go right back to that. So that's what I started to do. That's where best self comes in, right? Figuring out what makes us the amazing people that we are, 
All right, is it an everyday thing? It's not. I just asked a room full of adults to tell me their best self traits. And to be honest with you, there were some good things, but there was not enough. There, you, every single person here is amazing. You are so amazing that we don't even know it. We don't even know how good we are sometimes. We just don't because we don't sit around and think of how great we are. But sometimes you really need to do that. You need to think about what makes you the amazing parent you are, the amazing coach you are. Randy's showing up at the trap. Randy, you do that for free? Yeah. Yeah. Says it right there. But we don't sit around and think about these things. All right? He talked about being relentless. I said, I'm not relentless. I need to be relentless. I'm definitely not resilient because every time I got knocked down, I kept digging. I was one of those kids that, like, you hit rock bottom and I was still digging with the shovel, just running the shovel out. I said, I need to be resilient. And if I can have sweat equity, if I put sweat equity in anything I can do, I get my life back. And that's everything that I did. Everything I did, and I started from small. First time I went to the pool, I swam to one side or the other, and I said, I am going. I was at row, and I said, I'm going to freaking drown. Lori <laughs> <laughs> wasn't around. But, <laughs> so I got to the other end, looked at the other guy, and God was just going back and forth. I said, how the hell are they doing that? <laughs> my heart was ready to jump out of my chest. I mean, I'd, listen, I'm very cautious of what I do, and I'm not going to lie to you. I do a lot of high-intensity stuff, and there's some times where I'm like, don't fucking die in this pool. <laughs> Sorry for the language, but I'm like, don't, you went through all this stuff, don't die here. Yes. But I know it's going to take sweat equity, all right? I think that my opinion, I think winning is a choice of life. You don't have to do an Iron Man to be a winner. And I'm talking about life. Winning is a choice of life. You guys, we can choose to win by our actions of what we're doing, taking responsibility for ourselves, even as adults. Listen, I see it, I see it all the time. A parent will come in and they'll be talking to their, their son or daughter. And I'm like, here's the problem right here. A parent does not even have responsibility for themselves. And they're trying to ask their child to do that. And we can fall into that trap, even though we're all amazing people in this room. Right? All right, what happens if Lori sets up a meeting for something and she doesn't show up? It happens. I see it all the time. Lori would never do that, but I'm just saying. We have to be responsible for, for ourselves. All right? I, thought, I think it all comes back to mindset. All right? I had to start to believe that I can do whatever I wanted to do, even though I had been through a lot of stuff. I couldn't take none of that stuff back. When you rob somebody and you crawl, crawl through their window and steal shit from them, that's a horrible thing to do. I can't change that though. But I can start to change myself. I can never forget those things that I did, all the things. My biggest regret is the way I treat. People always ask, hey, the kids will ask, or uh, Adele will ask me, do you wish you could go back and change those? I'm like, the only thing I wish I could go back and change is the way I treated people. The way I treated people, because you cause pain to other people, and you cause pain to yourself, and that's the most thing that I wish I could change. I think mindset is the most important thing, and I think being, uncom being comfortable, being uncomfortable, whether you're doing whatever it is. I don't know, maybe that's bringing your husband chopping with you. <laughs> seriously, I mean, seriously, like, it might be me going, going to do, like, an art craft thing with Catherine, it's like watching paint dry, but it's, it's, I think people, number one, if you have the right mindset, and I tell people this, don't just go do it and go through the motions. Have the right mindset that you want to go through it and get something out of it. Get something out of it. Put yourself in an uncomfortable situation. It does not have to be physical. It could be a mental thing. And go through it and get it done. We all can do it, right? I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't really want to join the Badgers because I get social anxiety sometimes. It's really weird, like, being around people because I always think people are going to, like, for some reason, it is something that we all need to fix. We think people are looking at us and seeing different things. Like, are they looking at me and thinking that I'm a drug addict and alcoholic? Or they see, like, and I have to tell myself sometimes that I'm not that person anymore. You know, that's one thing when I met Catherine and I shared this story with her, right? Because I had turned myself around by myself. I white knuckled it. A lot of people go to different things and people do whatever you need to do to get yourself right. Mine was white knuckling. I said, I'm just going to do this on my own. I have to do it on my own. No one's going to be able to help me with this. I got to do it myself. So I eliminated everything, turned everything around, got into triathlon. River Winds was my first triathlon. And I was addicted, like, it was just, a, I traded some bad addictions for some good addictions. 
And it's okay. People are like, well, that can be that can be dangerous, man. Obsession is it really? Because I was obsessed with cocaine and meth. That almost killed me. Like you're going to tell, you're going to criticize me and tell me that being obsessed with swimming, biking, and running, like I like I don't believe that. We feel like, well, you got to be careful. Don't you're going to the gym and you're lifting and you're doing all these things. Do you have children, grandchildren? One, mama, you crazy? You doing all that stuff? <laughs> like, like. When they get old enough, they're going to look at you like they're your hero if they're already not doing that. But you have to understand, when people are saying, oh, you're, you're obsessed, it's literally, you got to stop, man. No, lose weight. People were telling me, you don't look right, man. Well, I don't look right because I was 305 pounds, dude. Now I'm 180. So there's a lot of criticism going on with that. Some of the things that I developed, I developed these seven laws of leadership. They're for me. They might be for you. You might have your own. But for me. Number one, responsibility. How to take personal responsibility for my own life, for all my actions, for everything that I do. When I'm a teacher, I take responsibility to adding value to your children. All right? Take responsibility to being a husband and, and father with Catherine. Right? Personal responsibility for every area that I have allegiance. Right? With the Badgers. I'm here. I will start to do more things because now I'm sitting in here, I'm like, yep, they know who the hell I am now. <laughs> no hiding that, I can start doing things. I can't explain things how I feel and what makes me me. People that are dealing with mental health issues like myself, we can't under I can't understand everything. But I can be my best version every day. And I know this, and I'm telling you guys right now, your best version does not have to be 100 percent Dan ain't gonna be. Matter of fact, most people in here are never gonna be at 100 percent but you got to believe, lose 75% on the day that he's having a rough day, his 75% is better than 10 other people's 90% because that's how amazing he is. And we have to think like this. Our best version is good enough. But the anti-self stuff, when you're not, that's not going to be good enough. Set goals in every area of your life. I set goals in every single area of my life, and I do it, rotate. Matter of fact, the sheet's sitting on my thing now where I have to update them. I update them as needed. Sometimes it's by season, spring, fall, winter. Sometimes it's by half, half years. It's just depending, and I have short goals in between. Your goals are nothing. You can take the paper, crinkle it up, and throw it in the trash unless you have an action plan. You have to have a plan for what you're doing, for everything. Right? For me, it's to become a better speaker. I want to keep on getting better. I'm not, I want to keep getting better at what I'm doing and delivering speeches. Well, how do you do that? You practice. You practice. You put the laptop in front of you, you write a speech, and then you read it. And then you do it over and over and over. It sounds like triathlon, doesn't it, guys? I mean, that's, how it, that's what that is. Go. Be mindful. Be a fully present in the moment. All right? It's one thing that I think every single person in here can work at, and you know what I'm talking about. You're washing the dishes. You're significant others talking to. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did it just on the driveway over here. So I'm thinking about here. But she's asking me questions. She told me the directions here six times. I said, so where the hell am I going? Where do you want to go? But we can all do better at being mindful. And that's being fully present in the moment of what you're doing when you're doing it. All right? If you're doing serious things, you can have serious consequences by not being mindful. Right? And I think that that's one thing that kind of reels me in because people always say, well, I'm a multitasker. Then you're not being mindful of what you're doing. I hear you on that. I hear you. And I tell kids this all the time. But... But you're only being mindful when you're focusing on one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. People are doing six different things. In le like, be mindful. Uh, trust. You've got you to be able to trust people. For me, growing up the way I did, that's one of the hardest things, being able to trust somebody when the people that you're supposed to trust have caused you heartache, right? And then I called heart heartache to other people. So trusting yourself, trusting others. Uh, respect. Treating people with respect. Um, being arrested 10 different times, there's definitely some disrespect there on many, on many fronts. On many fronts. But respecting myself and then respecting others. And when you're respecting others and you're dealing with them, you know, I was talking to a cop the other day and he was had a, I see it, a guy in the school research off has a problem with somebody and I was like, you kind of attacked him a little bit there. Dude. You're like talking about it like what he's wearing and stuff like that. I'm like, well, why don't you just tell him the behavior, what the behavior was. Because you're running yourself into problems. You're attacking, his, you're attacking him personally. Correct the behavior, not the person. And that's a big thing with adults, right, dealing with kids. And I'm not just talking about parenting. I'm talking about teachers. They're rolling up in there, and I'm like, I don't have to write people. I don't know. Like, I've been doing this 21 years teaching. I don't write many people up. 
Like I have one referral in like a 15 year period. One referral in 15 years, like how do you do that? And I'm like, I treat them how they need to be treated. I don't attack them, man. I tell them they have expectations walking in my room. The phone goes in the wall rack. You don't walk in my room with earbuds in. The expectations are very clear and they're mindful of that and there's that respect. The last one up on there is lead from the front and lead by example. Every single one of you guys in here are leaders. And a lot of the kids that you have coming in my classroom or that you might be dealing with, in anything, they might be leaders in their own household, man. I mean, I was in my house. My mom was never home, ever. I disappeared one time for three weeks at 13 years old. No one ever looked where, where I was, period. My mom called the cops. She found out where I was at. And the lady was like, he ain't been home in three weeks. <laughs> and you're looking for him now? You want to call the cops? Like, no one knew. But lead in front of front and lead by example. We are leaders in here. Um, a couple things to pass off to you, and we're going to wrap this thing up. Um, and I tell people this all the time. And, and for me, when I look at this, I'm like, okay, you're talking about being in a bad environment. Don't be a victim of your environment. Be a product of your decisions. For me, I know that I can't be going to Atlantic City with people drinking because I'm going to start drinking, and most likely, I'll probably start doing drugs, and I'm going to get into trouble. That's what's going to happen, right? For some of us, we have mental health issues that we're concerned about, and I call them uh, energy. Do you guys know, you guys know what I'm talking Energy vampires? Those people you go around like, damn, just sucked the whole, just <laughs> killed me. All the energy, out of me. Some of us need to know that there's some people that we can't hang around with. Be like, it's got to be short. It's got to be short. I'm going in, and I'm getting the hell out of the room because I'm going to suck. I know yes. you're saying yes. So you know what I'm talking about. So this is not just for something with drugs. Just don't be a victim of your environment. Be a product of your decision. Make smart decisions of whatever you're doing. If you go out, look, we had a parent of a kid the other day. The parent got a DWI. They were like, hey, doesn't even, my dad doesn't even drink, man. He just went to a bar. He was into the basketball game and made a bad decision at the bar. Devastated the kid. He was crying in school because his dad didn't really drink. When he became a victim of the event, all his friends were drinking in a bar. Guy's 50 years old. DWI. Because he got to let the environment take hold of him. It was that one instant, man. He wasn't thinking. And then you have a kid, you know, destroyed the kid in school. Um, who do you give your microphone to? Who do you let speak to you? Right? We're all doing triathlon here. People probably think you're crazy doing different stuff. Right? I don't know if you get into the Ironman or not. But who do you give your microphone to? Who do you let speak to you? We all have a microphone, but make sure you give your microphone to, to the right people. Because sometimes they can tell you the wrong things. Hey, Barb, you shouldn't be going to do that race in that country, man. There's no reason to go do that race. Barb, you're 40 years old. You don't need to do that no more. You don't. You're done. You're done. That's it, Barb. You're done. No more. You don't want to do Hey, you pick shop. Now it's going to stick in my mind. She picked shopper as her one word. Yeah, no, that was a joke. I know. That was a joke. joke. <laughs> she was on her phone over there spending the 10 bucks on the app. <laughs> no, more than 10. <laughs> Who do you get, make sure you give your microphone to the right people. And I will tell you this. Adults listen to the wrong people sometimes and so do the kids. And then the last thing on there is communication. I think communication is the biggest thing. Um, I never communicated ever. Communication. Communicate, communicate. When there's a void in communication in your household, out in life, that void's going to get filled with negativity. Now, that negativity can look like a bunch of different things, right? It can be like a husband and wife, just not, there's, there's that lack of communication in there. And you're not communicating and telling Lori, hey, I got this hamstring issue, and then Lori sends you out and, like, you got to communicate these things to me. When there's a void in communication, that void, that void will be filled with negativity. And sometimes, unfortunately, for people like me, that can be alcohol, drugs, could be bad, it could be bad things. Or for your kids, for your kids, your grandkids, make sure you're communicating with them. Ask them questions about stuff. Be very clear and concise. Hey, there's some bad stuff out on the street, man. Listen, you got to communicate with me like we did with our son. You had to tell them. I mean, my biggest thing, and I'm going to end here, is I thought that no one would ever understand me. Ain't nobody ever understand me. It's me talking to myself in my head. Don't tell that teacher that stuff. I was very close 
on five occasions of telling people my story, which would probably have gotten me out of a lot of trouble because it would just communicate would have probably just set me free. But I was so scared that people would not understand me, not realizing that people like you guys in here deal with stuff too. And some of you have came from different backgrounds yourself, dealing with different things with your family members and, and loved ones and different things like that. I thought that I was like the only one, and that's not the truth. When I met Catherine, I had cleaned myself up and was doing very well, and I said one day, I was like, man, I'm going to tell this girl like three months in, Jean, I was like, she's either going to run from me, <laughs> she's either going to run, or she's just going to sit and listen. And I sat her on the, I sat on the couch, remember like yesterday, she, it was her house in Minnetola, and I had everything, I, I mean, my life is my life, I can tell it however. Sat on the couch, and I told her who I was, what I had done, and she said some of the most powerful words you can ever tell somebody. And this is how this goes, and this is how we're going to end this. She said, you're not that person anymore. And it was like an anvil lifting off my chest. And I was just like, man, damn, that felt good. Because I realized that you don't have to be that person anymore if you don't want to be. But sometimes you need to tell people that. And that, and that was it. And I appreciate you guys listening to me in here. I appreciate you. Thank you very much. Um, I, will, I, will, like, I always tell people, I said, I, uh, I'll answer a couple questions if you want. I usually say, hey, give me three questions. Give me three and I'll get you out of here. Uh, any questions whatsoever? Did you have one? Yeah. Can you just explain your relentless pursuit where you're afraid? So what I do... I am a motive. I'm a, I'm a full time teacher, but I am a speaker. Um, I started. People started here. My matter of fact, I think it was what when I went to the Hall of Fame. Yes. When I went to the Hall of Fame, I got out in front of everybody. I kind of told them where I was from, and they didn't understand. Paulsboro had no idea. When I went to Paul, when I arrived in Paulsboro, the damage really was done. They knew some other stuff after that, obviously, but they didn't know what made me the way that I was. It was always, what the hell is wrong with you? What the hell is wrong with you, Dan? What the hell is wrong? No one ever asked me, what happened to you to make me do these things? No one ever asked me, what, what happens that made you want to do this? No one ever asked that. It was always, what the hell is wrong with this? He's bad, he's going to jail. Yeah, he's already locked up. Was, How the hell is he going to Rutgers? <clears throat> he's going to be in jail soon. And no one ever asked me that question. So at Fallsboro, I gave this speech, man, and if people came up right afterwards, like, you got to start telling your story, man. They're like, you got to go around the schools, you got to talk to adults, because it hits kind of everything. So I started my own speaking business, and I've spoken to many different people. I've spoken to adults, kids, usually cut it off at sixth grade, um, to middle school, through high school. I've spoken to colleges, um, different groups, but that's what my business is. Um, and that's called Relentless Pursuit. Tell them why, you, why it's called Relentless Pursuit. Relentless Pursuit? I mean, Relentless Pursuit is like my mantra. It's just I think that being in Relentless Pursuit of whatever you're doing and being in Relentless Pursuit of adding value to people is is one of the things that, that I want to do. Uh, you know, Relentless Pursuit, sweat, uh, Relentless Pursuit, Resilience, Sweat Equity is kind of things that have been really added in there, but I knew for me to be able to get to where I'm at, I knew it was going to take Relentless Pursuit. So, you know, that's that. Couple questions. I'll take a couple questions. Whatever we have, however many. Go. What's your advice for an athlete when it gets hard, like in a long race or a short race is really hard, but when it gets really hard? Yeah, I think having the proper mindset for that, just embracing that, that you know that that's going to happen. Um, mental you know. toughness. Yeah, I mean mental toughness. I'm like when I have some, when I have some of those thoughts, I'm like, damn, you're back again. Tell myself, like, you tell, tell me to walk, like, I ain't walking. I talk to myself, like, positive self. I'm huge on positive self-talk. Positive self-talk. When, 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 um, when you say that tough stuff, when you're in those tough spots in a race, you're talking to yourself. Kids are like, I ain't crazy. Yeah, you're talking. You got the good person, you got the bad person. The bad person is telling, that's your anti-self. Telling you it's getting tough, slow down. Hop off the bike. I say, shut the hell up. We're going, whether you like it or not. And you're doing this, but I've gotten better and better and better at that because it, the more you work on positive self-talk, the better you get. I start every morning, believe it or not, I read my own positive self-talk to myself that I create for myself. It's a list of 10 things 
that I tell myself about myself that makes me my best version. I play it, it's on my phone, I listen to it, um, and there's a couple other things that I do in the morning that kind of get me going. To be honest with you, I get up early to do different things that kind of get my mind going, but it really comes back to your mindset and being positive with yourself because it's always going to be tough. When is it not? When is any race not going to be tough? You got to talk to yourself, but there is a preparation part in there because I think every race is like 100% mental and 100% physical because you can have the strongest mentally person ever that did not put in the time for the race and they're going to fail. You can have somebody that is 100% physically fit and mentally they are weak, they're going to they're going to fail. You need 100% of both and you can train yourself in both. That's what I know because I've never been like this before. I was totally the opposite. I took every negative and I was mentally weak. I was mentally weak, physically weak, and I said, I need to turn these, I need to flip these things. How do I do it? What well, works for me? And that's talking to myself in a positive way. Do you have a podcast or courses or something? I do not, not yet anyway, but I mean, people have, I, my goal for the past, my goal the past year was to build up my presence with the, I've done, I mean, I have a YouTube channel. Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Yes, there's a YouTube, yes, there's a YouTube channel thing that I have. I'll put that up on here, guys, if you guys wanted to su subscribe to that. But I do. I'm not taking that next step to that. I mean, like I said, I am a full-time teacher. I'm speaking and maximizing that ability to that. And there are my, my goals, as I told you, that I write goals. One of my goals is to, to start improving on my social media presence. And you have to start somewhere, right? You can't just jump up and say, hey, I got 100 followers, and then you got... You have to start building, and that's by putting content out. So I'll write notes to myself on doing different things, um, and I'll put that up on here, and then I'll, I'll uh, it's not going down. Just think about. Um, yeah. Um, during this process of changing your life around and doing a lot of it on your own, did you have any other avenues for resources for yourself? Did you read any books? Did you? Like, did you do all this mental work, like, on, on your own? I read a lot of books. You read but a lot of books. A lot of it was, you can only get so much stuff from books. Right. Right, you can only get, like, Scooter. books and all these things, they inspire us and motivate us, and then you put it on the shelf, and then you forget right. about it. You have to find what, what, there's always different nuggets you can get from different things, and I've definitely picked up different things from, from those things. But it's really working for me. And that's what the question is. How did I get... Right. I mean, as I mentioned before, I white-knuckled getting through the drinking and the drugs and stuff like that. And flipping everything was just something that I had to look in the mirror, man. I had to look in the mirror, like the accountability mirror, man. David Goggins is a guy that I do follow. He's... A, he's, he's see, we, me, and him have been through similar things, although he, he's like on a different level. And everybody's on different levels. You don't have to be on... You don't have to be doing an Ironman to be in this club. You can be a runner. You can be a swimmer and just trying to figure out what's going on. But I think a lot of it is figuring out what works for you. I've read, I have read tons of books, though, and I share those with the kids that I lead. You have to find what, 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 what do you like. Find what piques your interest. I'll start listening to something, and in 20 minutes I'm like, that's not, that's not for me. Anybody else? Yes? Thinking back on the other thing, in the training, okay, you, you have these, these goals, and it's great, and you're excited about these goals, but then when it comes to the training, and you're like, I'm the trainer forever, forever, <laughs> ever, and you're not, and you're like dying, you're looking out the window, and it's like, what do you do with your brain then to say, okay, just suck it up and, and get through it, and then, and not give in to the... Like, I'm sure you, I mean, you find, you try to find good movies, you might be interested in the movie, but again, you're just, it's that goal of setting the plan. Right. I have different things as ever, Bert. Think of how good you're going to feel after I try that. <laughs> I can, I mean, I'll be honest, today, I was supposed to do two hours and 45 minutes. Yeah, I break it down. I, I, I don't go that way. I, like, break things down to smaller amounts. Right, so... My co you know, I'm on my trainer and um, I have Zwift and I'm watching a movie. And an hour and a half in and I start like stop pedaling and I get this bad habit. I stop, look around, okay, Marsh, stop it up, start pedaling. And it's not, I'm not finding the, the program hard. It's just, just 
sitting my butt there. I don't know. You gotta challenge it. I think just challenge yourself. I break things. I don't. I do those longer things too, but I break things down. That for me, what works for me is breaking things down into smaller pieces, okay. where I'm saying, hey, I'm, I'm getting here. And if something ever gets tough, when something does get tough, I'm like, you're doing this shit for three minutes, man. And if you can't do something for three minutes, something is seriously wrong with you. And I tell myself that. And once the three minutes is up, I'm like, I was all right. I mean, that was hard, but I'm good to go now. I mean, I was doing something for, I had like these intervals that were like seven minutes of really, really hard. And I got like the first minute, and I was like, shit, I ain't gonna be able to do this. And I just go three minutes in, and then next thing you know, I'll kind of like settle into that. But you have to find what, what works for you, for you, for you. You know, biking indoors is, I don't, I don't mind biking indoors. I'm a thinker. I do all my thinking when I'm, like, when I'm focused on what I'm doing. I'm very mindful of what I'm doing, but I like thinking as well when I'm doing those things. You have to find out what, what works for you. I hear you, though. I think Catherine runs off the trainer sometimes and hides in the bathroom. <laughs> Challenge yourself. Put a post it on your thing and say, challenge yourself the next time. And if you find yourself getting off a bunch of times, so let's say if you do a two-hour bike ride and you think you're getting off three times to take breaks, challenge yourself. Say, I'm only going to get off two times and I can get off any two times that I want. It can be two minutes, back to back in five minutes, but that's all I'm getting off. And then next time or after a while, say, I got one time hopping off. That's it. And then obviously, if you ever have to go to the bathroom, you ain't gonna sit there. <laughs> Challenge yourself. I put post-its in front of my thing and I'll say, this is what, like, focus on this. You're focusing on this this time. But that's, and I'm not perfect at it. I coach myself. I'm not perfect at it, but actually I'm not being coached. I'm, tried out. I'm being coached by Trida. But... Anything else? Got me through with the other man. Trida. Trida, yes. Anybody else? Guys, thank you very much. Yeah. Can you put up your seven steps? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we can oh, put, I think that's yeah, share that to uh, the can, can we share, will we be able to share this? Huh? Yeah. Can we be able to share this with the The video? Yeah. yeah. Oh, the, the, I mean, your slides. The slides? Yeah. I can share them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can send okay, it to so you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, thank you everybody for coming. We're trying to do this maybe twice a year or so. It's, it's tough to get everybody.